Good afternoon. Thanks very much for having me here. Um, how many people here have done any uh, studied cybersecurity at all? Any of you taken classes? A couple? All right. How many of you want to work in cybersecurity? A number of you. Anybody want to say why you want to work in cybersecurity? Anybody just shout it out? As, well, I'll throw out some things. Here are things people say, I want to work in cyber. Um, a lot of times I hear job security. Is that something that's, that's appealing? You want job security? Um, because we, we're going to have a shortage, right, of cybersecurity specialists. And depending on which research you're reading, it can be up to you know, a couple of million in the, the coming years. So job security. And are, are the bad guys going to stop attacking us? Criminals are criminals. You know, they're, they're always going to be going after the good guys. So there is, there's a level of job security. I hear money a lot. Is that some, a reason that, that people are going into you want money? Eh, who doesn't want money? Um, it's true. It's a fairly well-paid profession. Um, another thing I hear very commonly is you want to find and fight the bad guys, basically be the cyber police. And that is definitely one aspect of, of part of the job. So if any of those things are appealing to you, um, definitely cybersecurity does deliver on job security, <laughs> well paid, and you can also fight the bad guys. It's also just a really fascinating puzzle to solve. When I, I got into IT, information technology, probably before most of you were born, so <laughs> almost 30 years ago now, and the reason I got into IT was I just absolutely loved computers. I was on the internet before the Morris worm. For anybody who was at the previous talk, I was on there before, before the, and he was actually an, a mail admin who was like, I wonder if this will work, and it did. Um, but so I was on the, the internet back when it was the DARPAnet in the, in the 70s, fell absolutely in love with computers. Uh, but the thing about security is that it's the most, I think it's the most interesting part of IT. And yeah, you get to go after the bad guys, but you get, what you have to do is you have to think like a bad guy and think like a good guy. So you have to do the work on both sides, which is amazingly interesting and not, not easy to do. And what I'm going to talk about here are some of the threats and the trends of what the bad guys are doing. So you can see, kind of look under the covers of what they're doing and how they're doing it, both technically and socially. Because us, the people, they're going after the people too and against, against our human nature. And also then give ideas of how this can actually help us to defend against them. Because that's really what we're going for, right? We want to stop them from grabbing our data, from hurting us, from hurting our loved ones, taking our loved ones' information. So that's what we're going to talk about, looking at these threats and trends. But really, it's not to glorify the bad guys. It's not to glorify criminals or nation states who are attacking each other. It's so that we as defenders, and I hope for those of you who want to work in cybersecurity when you graduate, we as defenders know the best ways to defend. So the reality is, yes, the skills are definitely in short supply. If you were listening to the previous speakers, they were talking about uh, militarization of cyberspace. And cyberspace is the new battlefield. NATO has it as a new unit. You know, there's land, air, sea, cyber. NATO now counts cyber as another place where uh, we, can have, we can have warfare occurring. So it's, it's pretty serious. And, one of the, and you know, just as we, we, when we have on land, sea, and air, what do we have that gets mingled up? We get, sure, they're your enemy, but they're citizens of another country. You know, you, countries, the, the politicians and the military fights each other. It's not all the citizens that are necessarily fighting each other. So, and this happens, you know, if you think about the cloud, for example. Right? where a lot of governments are using the cloud. So is the cloud a military target? That's probably the same cloud that you're using uh, for your own personal information. So it's definitely, it's a new battlefield, and that's not really like an exaggeration. That's unfortunately a reality. And then the other thing is that because everything has become digital, everything can be attacked. Anybody heard of Shodan? Yes, we got here. You're a security person. <laughs> uh, so Shodan is actually, some people call it Google for uh, um, internet, uh, for IoT uh, attacks. But it, Shodan is a way to search what's available on the internet, things like IoT devices, ICS, industrial control devices. And uh, some attackers use it to find what's vulnerable. 
because it's out there on the, because they're now on the internet. So um, a lot of things that we, we use that run our lives and our world are now accessible on the internet. For example, uh, some nuclear power plants, for example, things, their controls are available for remote administration. So what does that mean if a bad guy was able to get that? Potentially they could raise and lower the core, the, the temperature on the nuclear core, for example. Our many, uh, very often you'll see traffic lights, whole electrical grids are managed now and, and are digitally and they're remotely accessible on the internet. So anything can be attacked, starting with what's in our pockets, our phones, all the way up to our critical infrastructure. And that's not to be a scary thing. That means that, I mean, because, you know, Anything can be attacked, can be, right, are we safe right here? A bomb could drop on us, an asteroid could come flying out of the sky, right? I mean, there's, it's true, like we think, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm safe because we feel comfortable. But, you know, when you start thinking like a cybersecurity person, again, this is not to be alarmist. It's not, oh God, I, you know, hide under the covers, you know, everything can be attacked. It's, in cybersecurity, we have to think about this, that it's true, there are risks everywhere, so it's, it, it's on us to build security in and to help educate. And one of the best ways to, to learn and understand what's going on is to look at the attackers and look at the data. And Microsoft has a lot of data, as you might, uh, you might, might uh, guess. So we have over 100 data centers around the globe the Azure cloud has a significant uh, number of amount of traffic that goes through it. 6.5 trillion signals a day that we look at for security information. That doesn't, I'm not saying 6.5 trillion attacks or incidents. It's 6.5 trillion signals that we need to go through and look at every day to look for where the attackers are and what they're doing. Obviously, it's, it, we're watching it 24-7, and we don't do a follow the sun. We actually man each of the data centers 24-7 too. So uh, it's not like one data center goes to sleep and another one picks up around the globe. They're all manned in shifts around the, around the day. And then um, each physical data center is protected both on a, a digital realm, but also on a physical realm. So things like cameras and gates. And, and other, to other uh, and man traps, you know, when you've ever been, I think they actually have one at the Lisbon airport where, you know, you walk in a little door and then it closes behind you and the door in front of you doesn't open before you're out. So that's a security feature, right? Because if you're a bad person, you're gonna get stuck. <laughs> and if you're a good person, you just wait and then you get out. So we have all kinds of physical security in our data centers and we monitor this information. We monitor the data that's going in and out of these data centers looking for bad activity, bad behavior, malicious uh, software, malicious attacks. We are looking at all of this. We do not look at information though for monetization. So when we're monitoring all the data that goes through the Azure cloud, we're not marketing it back out to you. <laughs> we're not showing you ads from it. We're, we're looking at it specifically for operational and security reasons. And we are very explicit about how we use all of your data. And I was really happy when I, I've, I've only been at Microsoft for about a year and a half now. I was really happy when I read their privacy um, and their transparency on the security center uh, before I joined because it, it was it written in human language. So it's not legalese. So you can see what we're doing with the data, which is nice because if you're not a lawyer, legalese is, is kind of hard to get through. So we bring all of this signal, remember 6.5 trillion signal a day, we bring in it from all of these different areas. Um, 400 billion emails are analyzed. Oh, this is, I, we need to fix that. That's a T, not a B up there. Um, uh, five billion threats are detected every month. And we also, if you, again, we're listening to the previous talk you know, about this is an ecosystem and we have to share information with partners and globally. We do that. We work internationally with our partners and with law enforcement too. So if we find a, a bad guy, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we do in the digital crimes unit. If you do really like that aspect of cyber, there are in fact cyber police um, that go out and, and find and prosecute the bad guys. So we, we bring all this intelligence together and uh, we, we share it out in a couple of different really important ways. The most important way is if you're using any of the systems, any of the Microsoft systems, for example, that we very rapidly, if one, if one Microsoft device 
has encounters a piece of malware, then that signal goes back up into the, the security graph so that all of the devices running Windows Defender, uh, for example, can be protected immediately. So, so one reason that we have this, this graph is we can detect problems early. We can also create this umbrella or this blanket of protection. The other thing is to share that information when it's going to be useful to people. So if we see a new piece of malware, we write it up and we put a blog out. And we also do an annual report, and uh, it's our, new, our latest report is going to be out on February 28th. I was kind of hoping it was going to be out so I could tell you what was in the new report, but I can't since it's under embargo. Uh, but it's going to be out on February 28th with our security intelligence report. So we take all this information that we've watched in the signals for the past year, and then we put it out in a free report. And it's free. Uh, we're not charging for this. This is, this is really about protection. So some of the key trends that are going on in attackers are now, probably if you've been around security, you're not going to, you especially, are not going to be going, oh, my gosh, I've never heard of any of these. <laughs> these are not, the, the attackers are, they're, they're changing their attacks in sort of subtle and in some ways, you know, complex ways. But we're seeing very similar types of attacks. So if you've heard botnets, phishing, and ransomware and miners, yes we're still facing those. Those are still actually very active attacks that are going on by, um, by criminals. And why are they still using them? Why are they still using, you know, trying to build out botnets? Or why do, you think, why do you think phishing is still one of the number one attack vectors? We've all heard of it. Shouldn't it be over now? It's so old, everybody. It still works. The attacker doesn't care if it's a new vulnerability or an old vulnerability. They just care if it still works. And that's a really, you know, we often, when we, we see the headlines, it's like, oh, what's the very latest thing? You know, how, what's, the, what's the newest? You know, if it's good old SQL injection, right? If, if you failed in your code, have you any coders here? If you're a developer, if you're a coder, validate your input. Very smart person, Caleb, uh, Caleb Seema said to me once, he said, you know, it shouldn't even really be the OWASP top 10. And I said, why? And he's like, you know, depending on the year, it's like sort of the OS top six or seven. And I said, because they're input validation errors. There are different views of different input validation errors. So validate your input. Um, but so we see, we will see that attackers, you know, they don't necessarily change in this completely new way. They just shift and create new techniques, and they will reuse old existing techniques as long as they continue to work. And well, how's the only way to get those old techniques or those old vulnerabilities to not work? Us. In phishing, not clicking on the link. When we write code, validate our input. These are the ways that we're going to defeat them. So botnets. If you haven't heard of what a botnet is, it's basically when a, an attacker says, I want to use a bunch of, of computer power. I want to I basically have a bunch of, you know, I, I wanna, don't want to rent mainframe space, right? I want to I use a bunch of power, but I don't have a bunch of systems. I want to do something that's kind of shady and under the radar, but I don't want to do it from one of my own systems. So they, they go out and they'll, on the dark web, Okay, who knows? Have you heard of the dark web? Yeah, everybody. Okay. Um, yes, the dark web is where the criminals tend to do their work, and it's called the dark web because it's not indexed. So most of the time, most of us, if you're writing a new website, you know, what do you want? You want it indexed. You want Google to have it. You want Bing to have it. You want it indexed because you want everybody to be able to find you. Well, the dark web, it's the opposite, right? They don't want to be found. They don't get indexed. So on the, that's where most of the time the, the dark web, this, this unindexed um, area of the internet where criminals do um, exchange information. You'll have one criminal say, I've got a botnet, it's a big botnet, and you can use it for your crypto coin mining, you can use it to launch a phishing attack, whatever. Um, come to me, pay me money, and I'll give you access to my botnet that I've herded for you. And they, they uh, control this botnet with something called a CNC or a C2, a command and control server. So that's sort of the brain. And the botnets have to talk to that command and control server to know what they're supposed to do. 
So botnets are pretty, they're pernicious. Um, if it's sort of a quiet botnet, if it's a botnet where the, the person who's the, the bad, the criminal, has got control of your device, doesn't want you to know that they're there, it's possible that you may not know. I mean, how would you know? If it's, just, if it's like coin mining in the background, maybe, maybe your machine's running a little hot, or you're like wondering why it seems to be working a little harder than it should when you're just writing a regular document or just writing an email. Uh, because that could be that you've got to, because the, the, you, you, you're part of a bot. So we want to take these bots down, right? It, and what's the core of how you can take a bot down? What does the bot need to do? It needs to talk to the command and control server, right? So if you can stop the communication of the command and the control server, what do all those bots do? They're kind of like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> right? you, you, you disconnect that communication. And in November of 2017, uh, Microsoft's Digital Crimes Unit actually took down, interrupted one of the leading botnets that was out there. It was called Gamaru. And it had really, it had huge widespread across the globe. Um, it is down. That doesn't mean that we haven't seen attempted infections, but we, when the communication goes, the command and control server is not available. So the command, we, we sync all that data, that, those requests, and um, and that means that, that, that again, you know, working internationally, we sync all the requests going out to the command and control servers. Within Gamaru, there were 44,000 different malware samples that were revealed within it. Um, there were uh, 1200, over 1,200 domains and IP addresses of the botnet CNC server. So it's not a server when you say command and control. It's, it's usually a, a, a spread of, of IP. It's a range of IPs, 464 distinct botnets that had been herded, and then over 80 different malware families. So this was a big monster that got taken down. Gamer was also kind of interesting in that it was one of these um, modular components. So for those of you that do development, have you ever used a library? And if you want to use, or you, say you want to use, you want to uh, uh, use a secure encryption, you know, communication point to point, right? Would you go out and create your own algorithm no, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. there are some people who are like, gosh, no. Um, yeah, do not do that. Uh, but you, what are you probably going to do? You use something like OpenSSL, right? So you use a known algorithm. You probably use a known library. Well, the bad guys are doing this too. They're creating componentized malware. And somebody will create, you know, like a, a little piece of it, and then they'll, they'll have plugins for it. So in Gamaru, there was the, the basic crime kit came with the bot builder, which built the, the binary malware, then the command and control app, right, how you get to the CNC server. And then this is handy, right? The bad guys, because they want other people to use their software, so there's often documentation. There's also actually very often um, uh, customer support. Now, in Gamaru, I don't think there was customer support, but it's not unusual that if, if you find somebody who, who wants to get you to use their malware, uh, then they need you to, to download it and try it out, and you, you can't, look, you can't uh, look, download it properly. They'll, they'll actually have customer support to help you use it. So Gamera with the plugins, though, Gamera, um, so that was the basic one, but then you could kind of upgrade or add on as a bad guy and add like a key logger into the basic crime kit. That would cost you an extra 150 bucks. Um, uh, a form grabber, for example, so if you've got people, you know, you're going and you're entering information in a web browser, right, form grabber, I'll get the, that information for you, that was 250, and then remote control through TeamViewer was another 250. So that's what Gamaru looked like. It was a big beast, and uh, it has been disrupted for now. And you know, here again, you want to get that, you want to stop the, the contact and the communication to the CNC server. Ultimately, you know, if you can find the criminal who's behind or the criminal gang or the criminal enterprise, because a lot of times it's actually, it's, a, it's an organized uh, group. So that's another way to stop it. Um, the other thing is to, to get on the actual endpoints themselves and do protection there. So in the cloud, right, we can block the access to, we can sync all the access to the CNC servers, but also on the endpoints, we want to make absolutely sure that we've done as much as possible to protect those endpoints if they do encounter that malware and block it and remove it. So in Gamaru, uh, it, remember I said it was taken down in, in November, right, of 2017. But look at the encounter rates, the devices that were still getting into, it doesn't mean that they could talk 
to their CNC servers, but it was actually still getting distributed at a pretty high. Now, as it, as it was less and less useful for the bad guys, we saw fewer and fewer actual incidents of it. But um, it, you know, it's, it's worth a note that when we say something goes down or disrupted, you know, there's a reason that Microsoft didn't say, we've killed Gamaru dead, you'll never see it again, that we're very careful when we say disruption because these attackers are looking for ways to, to reopen, start up again. So it's, it's an ongoing game. That's why it's not a declare victory, everybody's safe. It's a continuous ongoing monitor 24 seven around the globe. One thing that can help in this, and I'll talk a little bit more later, is looking at machine learning and artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning models, so that we can do better at sifting through the data and sifting through the activity from the bad guys to be able to find um, if there is something malicious much faster. And you might wonder, if you, since I know this isn't, a, a lot of you haven't studied um, security specifically, a question I get a lot is, well, why don't you just block it all? Like, why don't you just block all the bad software? Because it's really, the software that's malicious, it's not like in, in TV, like Mr. Robot, where, you know, the bad code's in red <laughs> and the good code's and It can be actually really hard, especially some developers. I used to do assessments back uh, years ago in my career, and I was always really surprised. Like, sometimes developers, legit good developers, do really weird things in their code that may not seem like it's innocuous, but it actually is. And sometimes users, sometimes we on our own devices, right, we can do strange things on our devices. So it's not as easy as, oh, that's definitely bad, that's good. And what's the worst thing if you're a network admin? It's the worst thing if you're running a website, for example, running a web server, if you're, if you're the CIO. If the company can't keep moving, if the email stops, if access to the website stops, so if you brick a system, if you stop connectivity, that's bad. So in security, we always have to play this balancing game. We have to be careful that we're finding the bad guys and stopping the bad guys, but we're not stopping the, the actual business work. And that can be a little bit trickier than, than it sounds. I wish that they would wave a little flag saying we're bad, uh, but they don't. Okay, so phishing. Anybody here ever clicked on a link and then after you clicked on that link, you went like, uh. Maybe you just got rickrolled. Do you guys rickroll each other here? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of like a best case, you get to hear, you get to hear um, a good song. But anyway, so, so phishing is still actually one of the number one attack vectors. And phishing is when you send somebody an email and you want them to click on that, that email, and then you take them either to a nefarious website or you initiate a download or a lot of different things that happen at the end of the phish. Another big um, area where we've seen a rise in attacks is in fileless malware. And it's because security programs are getting better and better at finding the file-based malware. So they're trying, so the attackers are using fileless malware whenever possible because it's harder to detect. So um, in phishing, uh, some of the things that they do is they send an email, they try and get you, the, the trick is get you to click on the link, get you to click on the attachment. They use a couple of tricks to try and do that so the domain may appear to come from from a, you know, a domain that you know, or they, they change one, one uh, letter, so Microsoft, but sold with a zero instead of an O kind of stuff. Um, uh, user impersonation, so it's not unusual that you'll see in a fish, somebody's trying, pretending to be somebody else. And they, you know, they, like it's a new account, new phone, who dis kind of thing, but you know, the, it, it's really me, and they get, they get pretty, um, pretty specific about how they're trying to get two people. I, I think of these as laser, laser fishes because you know, there's, there's just a fish, which is sort of a big broad. They're trying to grab whoever they can, get anybody to click on the link. These are sort of the classic ones were from years ago. It would be, I'm a Nigerian prince, and if you give me a million dollars or you know, $100,000, I'll be able to, to release this you know, $500 million from my my princely cache of jewels, so please just do that and then, then I'll give you, you know, I'll repay you in, in tenfold, right? So those, some people did fall for that, but people kind of, we picked up on this pretty quickly, that's not. So the, most of the, these really like close spear fishes, what they are, are very targeted at you and your, your information. And social networks 
give us a great way to be able to do this kind of, of information gathering. So one that I, I thought was very interesting that was explained to me um, from, by a, a, a CISO was that there had been a party the night before and one person had done kind of a funny dance, but nobody had it on, on video. And, but people were posting this on you know, the party, about the company, you know, who had done the funny dance. They were tagging them on Facebook, they were on Twitter. It was pretty easy if you, you know, this was publicly available information. So the fish was, hey, I actually, somebody had a video of so-and-so doing that dance last night, sending it to the company. Well, that's incredibly targeted, right? You're not, you, you know that a Nigerian prince probably isn't writing to you to give you a million dollars in jewels, but what about your coworker saying they got a video from the party you all were at last night, right? That's, that's a little bit harder for people to get through. Um, it is still one of the number one attack vectors, phishing, and it is because we click. Um, so there's got to be a, a, it's got to be a two-fold effort. It's got to be partly that we get better at figuring out what these fishes are and not clicking on them, but our technology also has to get better too. So to sort of save us from ourselves, because there are going to be some really good fishes. A former CISO of a, a bank that's now defunct uh, in the United States said to me once, I got an email and it was so good that if it hadn't been signed by me and I knew I didn't write it, I would never have known it was a fake. So um, it's, it's that education, but it's also we need the technology, technology to do things like checking the link when it comes into our in inboxes so we can do that. Tech technology can look at the link as that email comes into your inbox and identify if it's going to a known malicious site, for example, or if there's, it's going to a site that's not known as malicious but does happen to be harboring malicious content on it. Um, the other thing is that we don't always just, when the, when the mail comes in, the attackers know that there, there are hygiene and there are servers that now check mail as it goes in. So what they do is they do a rapid refresh. So they send the mail, it's fine, Half an hour later, they're, they're hosting malicious content on that destination site. So also checking when people link and go out, so at click too. 20% um, of, of users click on a malicious link in the first five minutes of receiving it, so it goes pretty quickly. And then the attack spectrum, it really can go across the phishing chain. It goes from, from fairly cheap, these are like those Nigerian scams I was talking about where you just get a bunch of emails and just send out um, you know, sort of anything all the way up to these very, very targeted super spear or laser fish where you know so much about the company. These generally are going against a very specific target. So the, a, a company, a person at a company has, or a high, it's a high value target, for example. So they know that they want to go after. Um, there was a, a dire wolf campaign that went on uh, a few years ago and in that campaign, the targets were all companies that regularly transferred more than a million dollars in one whack. And that's what the attackers did. They created this social and technical attack so that they could get those million, two million dollars transferred in one whack. So that, that's kind of what you'll see a lot more money getting spent by the attacker on that kind of attack, but it's also because they're looking for a bigger payout or a bigger, um, a bigger, bigger payday. So how do we stop phishing? Partly it's us, it really is us. And a lot of companies now, what they do is they, they have regular um, uh, phishing uh, schemes that they'll actually do on their own employees. We actually have something called a tax simulator that you can use for free so you can fish your own organization. Not because you want to fish them to send them to someplace malicious, it's malicious, it's to help them understand uh, you know, who in your company maybe needs a little bit of extra help to understand when there's a fish and when there's not a fish. But the technology's got to help us too. So um, Microsoft actually looked at, at, you know, how good our catch rate was over the past year versus the competitors. And uh, this is the fish email miss. I want to make this very clear. This is, this is who missed the most. This is Microsoft. <laughs> Um, we, we missed the most up until one of our competitors really made a bad miss here. Uh, but uh, we were missing a lot and it, we were like, okay, this is just completely unacceptable. 
How can customers trust us if we're going to be missing at this rate? We have to get our catch rate down. We have to, to lower that miss. And we did. So we did a lot of work on um, putting additional features and functions in. And yes, I'm talking about stuff that's in Microsoft products, but really, again, think like a defender. Think, understand the attacker. And what I'm showing you are things that anybody, any company uh, that's, that's catching phishing, that wants to catch phishing, could put into their system. So this is, it's a little bit of an eye chart here. With, but our miss rate, when we added in these other features, went way, way down. So that means our catch rate went up, the miss weight rate went way down. So that's a good thing. So what was it? How do we catch the fish? Uh, using things like DMARC and SPF so that you can validate who the sender is and the sender framework and email, this really made a big difference. Uh, looking at implicit intra-org and even identifying if something came from outside your company. So if you, if you use Outlook, for example, you'll see this every time you send an email, there's a little warning if it's somebody that's outside of the organization. Or you'll even get a warning, because sometimes that's, again, right? You want to, they're imitating people that you know. I'll say, you've gotten an email from somebody who's got a similar name and address in the past, but this looks different to me, right? So if they're trying to do those subtle changes in the domain name, that uh, being able to show that out. Uh, Cross-domain spoof detection was another way to get that really down. Um, detonating the content, again, just like the link can come in and it's going to a non-malicious site, and then five minutes later, they've turned on the malicious content. Um, also, actually launching an attachment, so, so detonating it. This it sounds a little bit awful, but that's, it basically means executing the attachment. So you, you use it in a machine in a safe sandbox. You do what a human would do. You emulate that activity. So if it's the attachment is a, is a uh, Word document, for example, then you, to detonate it, it means that you open up the Word document. And if there are macros in the Word document, you run those macros. And you do this in a, in a sandbox environment so that it's safe and it doesn't see, it, it's not going to damage the, the, uh, the endpoint. Also looking at uh, URLs and text lures. And then when, if somebody has been compromised, again, using these um, internal checks. So once somebody's, somebody's got the email, check when they're actually clicking on it. And then this one was a really, really, really big one. How many of you use multi-factor? Does the university enforce multi-factor authentication? Yes? OK. Yay. Um, this is huge. What happens if you're using multi-factor authentication and somebody gets your user ID and your, your password? Can they get in? No, not if you've got two-factor authentication turned on. So, and in any, any service that you use, so if you're using, if you're using Outlook, if you're using Google, uh, Strongly, strongly recommend turning on multi-factor authentication because it's a really good, it's not going to solve every problem. There's no magic bullet anywhere in security, but it really reduces um, the attack space that the attacker um, can get to you um, by. And then also in, in uh, looking at things like the uh, uh, look-alike domains and uh, brand impersonation. So watching for that, seeing if there's in the gray spaces, if people are starting to do brand impersonation. This, adding these features and capacities in are what really helped. So, and it was by looking at what the miss rate was, understanding what the attackers were doing, and improving the software. And that, again, if you do go into cyber, or if you go into software development and you, you don't, you don't want to be a cyber expert, you, but you want to be a really good, resilient software developer, um, you know, definitely think about these, uh, that, the same kind of thing. Learning what the attackers do so that you can code around them. Fileless malware. This is kind of an interesting one. It's like, is it, it's not 100% fileless, but, um, it, it, it has some really interesting features, and all of these are designed to have it go under the radar, and there has been a real increase in fileless malware in the past couple of years. So when it doesn't touch the, the disk, very often it, it will not trigger a traditional AV antivirus scanner, and it's because it's not touching the disk. Um, it's very often loaded as part of a, of a legitimate process, 
and it covers its tracks really, really, really well. So it can be really hard after the fact to go in and do some of this post-mortem forensic analysis because it's basically it's, it's trying to hide itself um, as, as uh, much as possible. Now, to try and figure out how to defeat fileless malware, uh, we ended up creating this taxonomy of file lists and looking at the two different ones. So the first one, the type one, is no file activity was performed. And that's that true, completely fileless malware. It's not writing to the disk. It's all going on in memory. Type two was that files weren't written to the disk, but some files were actually used indirectly. And then type three was that it, this goes into more classic malware, where it may have started off in a more fileless manner. But then ultimately, um, files were required, and that was mostly to create some level of persistence. Because if you don't write something right, if, if something's in memory only, and you turn off your system, what happens? It's wiped. So that's why with, to get persistence, you start to actually go and, and write some of these files. And a big, uh, a, a big uh, campaign of fileless malware was, uh, broke out last September and it was called Ursniff. And this one I thought was really kind of interesting, both for what the attackers did with it and also how we ended up catching it. So what was interesting about what the attackers did is that they took kind of smaller areas, like St. Louis, um, Knoxville, Tennessee, these sort of smaller places. Most of the time when people in the U.S., if you're from the U.S. and you travel abroad, and, and people say where you're from, if you say anything other than New York, it's kind of like, doesn't count, you know. Sometimes San Francisco or LA, but you know. So these are like, yeah, these are not the biggest parts, of, you know, the most populous parts of of, uh, of the United States. San Antonio here in Texas, that's actually pretty pretty populated. But anyway, they were targeting these smaller uh, smaller areas very specifically. What they did was they looked at uh, companies in those geo areas. So you know, in Knoxville and St. Louis, a company like a rug company. That's a car. It's not a chain. It's not a. It's just a, a carpet company that's unique to that town or that area. And they sent an email with an attachment purporting to come from that company. Which is a pretty clever way to, to move towards a spearfish at a pretty cheap price. Because can you figure out what local? You know, if you if you if you wanted to know what a carpet store that was only existed in the St. Louis area was, could you do that now in less than two minutes? Sure you could, right? You just go out and you Google it, right? <laughs> or Bing it, Bing it. Go out and Bing it. Um, but the, so that's what they, so they, they, they found out what the names of these companies were. So that it, it was spear fishy in that the people that got the attachment, they're like, well, my local carpet company wouldn't be attacking me. You know? uh, but no, it was a bad guy. Um, and, but it was, and it was fileless malware. And then it was in a macro, and it said, could you click this? It was, you know, it was a, you have to pay for this, or here's something I need your, your input on, right? So you click it, and oh, it launched, um, it launched the fileless malware. Oh, and here I have a picture of it. So here you go. So it's, uh, here you're getting, hey, just go into Office 365 and look at this document from this totally innocuous company that was actually in the area, but it wasn't really from the company. And then here's the example, like this one. This is uh, dockery floor flooring, for example. And then this is really common in fileless malware, is that you'll get a whole bunch of chaff around the actual PowerShell command, if it's going to execute a PowerShell command. So it then goes through and the activity. So if you're, just, if you're just regular old AV and you're looking at, oh, let me just look at the code. This doesn't look, I don't know what this code's going to do, but it doesn't look like it's bad, right? What you have to do is ultimately deobfuscate it and then get to what the actual command is. So that's what, that when you clicked on that macro, that's what it did. It deobfuscated it and turned it into what was actually a PowerShell command. And then the PowerShell command uh, could then be run. Now, again, this is something that can go past, right? AV may not be able to catch it because it's so well obfuscated. And sometimes until it's, you actually see that obfus it's actually gone through its, its uh, deobfuscation routine, you're not going to see the, the command. But if you are going back to detonating, remember executing it, opening the file, and opening the macros, 
in a secure space, right, then you can, you will see this. You'll see it start to work. So we actually found Ursniff up in the cloud when we were looking at its activity in a sandbox. And it was not just one machine learning model. And this is something I want to be really, really clear about. So AI and machine learning are kind of the buzzwords, right, in technology now. I mean, like, it's everywhere. And it, it, sometimes it feels like machine learning is going to solve all of our problems. We magically will have no security problems anymore because machine there's, it, it, there's not a magic machine learning model. And this is real math and real data science. And that means that it's not, there's not perfection at this point. There's learning and improvement and getting better at it. And four of our machine learning models are very focused on, on fileless malware. Uh, four of them uh, found this up in the cloud. But it was four different models looking very much at the behavior associated with the activity of fileless malware. So again, this is not, there's not, there's, there's, not, there's not magic there. But when we do look at machine learning and how it is helping us to find things that were very under the radar before, it's really, really, really hopeful. Uh, and I'm excited about the advancements. But yeah, I want to just be really clear that it kind of like makes me a little bit nuts when you hear some, somebody say, AI is going to save us from everything because it's not, we're not quite there yet. Okay, so ransomware and, and coin miners. Ransomware, we've all heard of WannaCry, and that's classic ransomware. It's, you lock up the machine, it's really loud. I sort of think of these as like, you know, um, you know, that like thinking fast and slow, right? This is really fast and loud because it gets onto your system and it wants to tell you it's there really quickly because it wants to lock up your machine and say, give me that sweet, sweet Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency the attacker wants. Crypto miners are kind of the opposite. The attacker doesn't want you to know that they've got a crypto miner on your machine. They want to use your processing power to do proof of work, uh, cryptographic uh, computational, uh, cryptographic computation on your endpoint. So they want to actually be kind of quiet with the crypto miner. And these two are, uh, what we saw was over the past year, you know, as the, the ransomware was going down, the crypto miner activity was going up. And it's in general because the, we were getting better at detecting Ransomware. The other thing, and this is a really great and happy thing, companies and, and users and, and small businesses, we're getting a lot better at backing our stuff up. If you've got a full backup and someone gets onto your system and says, gotcha, ransomware, and you got a full backup, what are you going to say? Are you going to pay them their, their cryptocurrency or are you going to tell them, forget it, I'm going to reimage this machine, I got a backup. Right? You're probably going to reimage your machine. Why would you pay for something you already have it back? So, so that's one of the, they were getting less successful. So that's a good thing. Um, does it mean that we've seen the end of ransomware? Nah. Because what, it, what if they get good at it again, if they start to be able to monetize it again, we will see ransomware pick up again. So um, the big ransomware that everybody knows about is WannaCry. Uh, Petcha, not Petcha. The reason that it's called not, does anybody know why it's, it's, and this was a big fight. You know how it's like, it's amazing how people get into these like huge flame wars with each other over, you know, is this Petcha or not Petcha? So, so does anybody know why it was, why the, the big war about Petya versus not Petya? So Petya was actually ransomware. Not Petya, which was the attack that happened in June of 2017 that we heard so much about that started in the Ukraine. Um, NotPetya was actually destructionware. So rather than locking up your files and saying, pay me the Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency, and then unlocking the files, what NotPetya did was it destroyed all the files and then said, pay me. But it didn't matter if you paid or not because the files had, had already been shredded. So that's why you, you will see it as, as like Petya, not Petya. Um, and then who heard of Bad Rabbit, though? Yeah, so Bad Rabbit, not, you heard everything. Uh, bad, bad Rabbit, uh, which was posing as an Adobe Flash update, but was not. Um, bad Rabbit, actually, the reason that it didn't get such, such widespread attention is that that's one that we actually caught in 14 minutes. 
And again, thank you, machine learning helped with that. So bad rabbit, this is again, you know, showing that as we get, as we continue to look at the activity of the attackers, we can also get better as defenders. Uh, Petya, or not Petya, uh, did have a really huge impact. So these are three different companies. So if, if you think like, oh, well, it, it, can't, it can't impact companies that much, you know, the company reported losses up to $310 million. And it's not just because the data is gone. So you might think, oh, if I have that data, you know, I said, hey, you can restore it. And it's like, yeah, you can. But anybody here uh, in financial services or want to work in financial services? So in financial services, milliseconds can mean millions of dollars. So even having to go in and restore 100 servers, that can actually have a huge financial impact. So as we look, and with NotPetya, it wasn't even ransomware. It was actually destructionware. And it moved very, very quickly. So we, we heard from the previous speakers about impact on the, the NHS, the National Health System, from WannaCry in the UK. So it's, again, not to be scary, but these attacks really are having significant financial productivity um, impact to organizations. And the other thing that, that's going on that we're seeing as a pretty big a vector is looking at rapid movement of cyber attacks. So spreading as quickly as possible. One company that got attacked by NotPetya, it was within 12 minutes that they had massive infections throughout the organization. So we're seeing really, really rapid movement. The movement can be going, is, is going in an automated way, so no human, once, once you got one human to click, it's now spreading as much as possible on its own, and they are, as we're seeing financially and operationally, becoming very, very disruptive. Um, one, any network engineers here? Networks, okay. Um, so just a little plug, if anybody is, is a network engineer. Uh, segmentation, whether we're talking about virtual micro-segmentation, which is part of this whole new zero trust, model, um, or good old physical segmentation, which is what I used to do. Um, you know, the, that as the more segmentation we can build into our networks or our workloads or our workspaces, because now a lot of this is going to be virtual micro segmentation, the better we can do some of this, stop some of this rapid spread, because a lot of the rapid spreads are because we've got very open networks. So just a little plug there if anybody's looking into networking and segmentation. Um, so uh, I had mentioned that the, the ransomware had gone down and crypto mining had, had gone up. And this is just some examples of um, uh, here, uh, Trojan, unique encounters with Trojanized crypto miners or coin miners. And then um, this one with uh, encounter rates for the coin miners. So there's definitely, there's, there's a trend going on the, the way up. And how do crypto uh, miners work? Just really, or coin miners, sorry, uh, really quickly. Sometimes they do uh, things like crypto jacking. So they'll actually get at their, their uh, browser based and they'll uh, do things like uh, compromise or inject into the middle of the, the browser page. Bogus spite sites. So, hey, come stream this video. And while you're watching the video, there's a coin miner getting installed on your, your back end and starting to do the and starting to do the coin mining. Um, and also tech support scams. You've been infected or go here and read about this, this new um, support page and then, or you know, you've been infected. So sometimes they can't actually give you an infection, but they can get a splash screen up. You've been infected, go to this website. We'll tell you how to get out of there. And then it's at that website that you'll see that there's actually, that that's where the script, the drive-by script is getting uh, onto your system. And you can't close the, the, the page, for example, and the coin miners running all the time in the background. One of the most famous coin miners for coin mine, uh, coin mine interested people is Dofoil. And Dofoil was part of a, a media get. It's a BitTorrent client that sometimes people go to if they want to watch videos that may not be available in another legal way, which is why it's, we call it a potentially unwanted application, because it's not, it's not malicious itself, um, but some people use it in a malicious way. So what happened was the attackers actually got into the update to the server and poisoned it so that when it was running, it starts out looking signed, it's all good, but when it runs, runs the update exe, the update is poisoned, and then the new version of the media get was in fact poisoned with this coin miner, with Dofoil.
again, machine learning is not magic, <laughs> but it's really, really, really helping us in the fight against the, the criminals, against the bad guys, and against the attackers. And a layered machine learning model is, is looking to be the most useful. So if there used to, we used to say this all the time, you know, layered security. Uh, or defense in depth. Have you ever heard this term, defense in depth? And that meant that there wasn't just, it wasn't just a door, right? You have multiple different kinds of locks and protections. If you think about a hotel, right, there's somebody who's guarding when you get into the, into the room. You may need a key card then to go up to your room. When you're in your room, you need the key card again. In the room, you also have locks and you have a safe, right? There are multiples, it's layers, it's defense in depth. This is what we're seeing play out in machine learning too. And we're looking at kind of a, 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 an approach of trying to use as much of the learning and the analysis that you can where there's a ton of data, and then bringing that data down into, I know it says big data here, and it's like, but it looks like it's less data. Well, it is, it's less, because a lot of the data on endpoints is, is replicated. So if you think of all the Windows endpoints around the world, if they're getting served up the same malware, then that, you get a lot of those copies. So we're, we're bringing the noise down and the signal up and using machine learning a long way. The other thing is that machine learning, if you can, if you can identify that something's malicious on an endpoint, how quickly can you find and stop that? Pretty rapidly. I mean, so up, up time, so I was talking about milliseconds. Um, I think it was Dofoil that it was in, in milliseconds actually that we were able to grab this and say, okay, that's a problem. But you can't always identify malicious or bad uh, bad code on the endpoint. Sometimes it's just not malicious enough. It does, it's not waving that I'm a bad guy flag. It's not wearing a little pirate hat. Um, so you bring it up, then you go into things like meta-based um, machine learning models in the cloud. The detonation I was talking about, that actually takes a while. That can take up to a few minutes. That's why it took us 14 minutes to find Bad Rabbit. We did have to detonate it. So you try here as much as you possibly can to, to detect attacks, but know that it's really, it's about defense in depth, it's about multiple different machine learning models, and it's about all of that working together. Because getting those signals and sharing that information, if it was just sort of, if, you law, if we became like, you know, an Oliver Sacks person who, you know, loses all their memory from here to here, then this wouldn't be as informed. So it's also sharing that knowledge as it goes down, and making those smart decisions as, as much as you can on the edge, but then also bringing it up to the cloud too for additional, um, additional testing. I mentioned the Digital Crimes Unit. This is, these are the folks at, at Microsoft that lead to the fight against cybercrime, but there are people around the world that do this kind of work too. At Microsoft, we have investigators and forensic um, analysts. We do use a lot of that machine learning and that layered machine learning that I was talking about. And we work in public and private partnerships. So when we do find bad guys, like when we found Gamaru, we worked with other large technology companies and we worked with international law enforcement to help bring them down. So this is the team that does that. They spend their time uh, not just looking for the bad guys, but also going and enforcing them, which is a little bit different. A lot of companies don't do the enforcement part. So this is a little bit different um, that we do the enforcement too. Some of the other things that happen at the Digital Crimes Unit, and if you're ever in Redmond, uh, they have a great tour of their, whole, their, their digital crime um, activity, uh, their, the unit. Um, they look at tech support fraud. This one is really common uh, in a lot of geolocations. Tech support fraud goes after the elderly, so it's kind of really awful. They call up, they say, hey, I'm from Microsoft. You know, I, I need you to update, go to this website and update your um, you know, your, your, your windows. And a lot of older people or non-tech savvy people will fall for it. You know, I have to, I have to tell some, some people in my family, you know, no, they'll say, why, why is Microsoft always calling me? I'm like, we're not. <laughs> we are not calling you. That's a tech support fraud. So we, we enforce against them. We also do a lot of training um, with that community. Online child exploitation, so we actually have a technology called PhotoDNA that looks at photos that can help identify uh, criminal uh, photographic activity, uh, pedophilia. 
And uh, we actually share that technology too with the world. So that's used by the, it's developed in the crimes unit, but it's actually shared with the world because it's one of those things that it's just, sometimes in the fight against cybercrime, it's about working with the community and making all of us better and stronger. It's not about selling a product. Um, the strategic enforcement I, I talked about, um, looking at the malware and then identifying information and looking at activity in nation state actors. So we've uh, started a group called Defending Democracy. And have, uh, and have already taken down some sites. We did find some nation states were attempting to attack, surprise, the US midterm elections. Um, and uh, you know, identifying where they were and bringing, that, bringing those, those folks, bringing their, their activities down and stopping them as much as possible. And I think that this, this is an area where we're only going to see an increase because now that the bad guys and the criminals have figured out that they can uh, distribute misinformation through different social media and that it may impact how people are voting, um, they're starting to do more and more of this. And there's actually, for anybody that reads The New Yorker, it's a really good magazine out of the US, there's a piece in, in this week's New Yorker about uh, companies in Israel, Psy Group, and how they were actually used, this is the really interesting, to, to impact, to try and, and, and uh, uh, to, to get a particular outcome in an election in the United States. Not an election you would even think about. It was the election to a board member at a hospital. And which sounds like, wow, that's just so like small. Luckily, the, the person who was trying to influence that election actually ended up losing. But it's because politically, that hospital then had repercussions within the bigger system. So um, yeah, this is, it's definitely an area to watch. And if you're thinking where to, where to focus, I think looking at cyber criminals focusing on misinformation and disinformation is going to be a really, really fascinating area coming up because um, just because, you know, when we think elections, sure, we always think of the big ones like presidents, but elections can actually impact us in so many different areas of our lives. Like that example of, you know, a board member at a hospital actually had, you know, significant repercussions. Um, then the final thing that we're doing that is important in that, you know, work together and, and try and make the world a safer place is actually we are part of and one of the founders of something called the Cybersecurity Tech Accord. And one of the previous speakers was talking about John Perry Barlow saying basically like government in the future, if you don't get the future, get away from us. Um, the Cybersecurity Tech Accord is not saying government you know, you definitely don't get it. That's not the intent at all. But it, it what it is, is is an attempt by or an action by the technical communities and the techno technical companies to say, let's get together and have rules of the road and agreements on how our technology will be used so that we're all you know, playing fair. It doesn't mean we're not, we're, we're still, obviously we're still uh, you know, uh, gonna be competing with each other for share of the, you know, share of the browser, share of the, share of the screen, but these tech accord principles are you know, basic rules of the road. You know, with, we'll protect our users and customers, uh, oppose efforts to attack innocent citizens. So if there's a government trying to attack citizens, and this goes again to that, what's that cyber you know, warfare dimension? This tech accord is bringing that together um, and then empowering users and helping to educate back about how to strengthen cybersecurity and to partner to, in, within this tech accord. So the Tech Accord already has some really big players. We've got, you know, my, obviously we're in it. Um, Dell is part of it, CA Technologies, Cisco, Facebook. So, you know, you probably see a lot of companies here that you say, well, they look like, you know, aren't you guys competitors? Yes, but, uh, you know, it, in, as, as it comes to rules of the road and, and making sure citizens are safe in cyberspace, we're all working together as signatories as part of the Cyber um, Tech Accord. So just a, a wrap up, this is a, if, if you are going into cybersecurity and you're interested in like, you know, how you help organizations get better with their security, or if you're just sort of curious what some top level, high level recommendations, these are them. These are by studying the attacker playbook. Uh, we, you know, came up with these list of recommendations. And you know, machine learning, as I said, is helping us in areas where the playbooks are emerging and, and new. But you know, some things to 
Uh, backups, you know, I've already mentioned a lot of these, the backups, right? If somebody gets, you, gets ransomware, if you have a backup, you're already in a better state. If you do get the reminder to do an update, we don't think about it at all. I mean, on your phone, right, do you get updates on some, some app updates every day, right, on your phone at least. So we, th we do that like just matter of course, but you know, making sure that we've got that on all the systems that we're using where possible. I know in things like operational technology, it can be hard. Uh, isolating that segmentation I was talking about um, can be really, really important. Looking at browser protections and privacy. And uh, if you do any admin work, and if you're doing any testing and you're doing any hacking and stuff like that, create separation. So maybe do it on a different device. Uh, like physical separation, um, or do it, uh, make sure that you, you in a, a large organization enterprise, um, or in a, even in a university environment, don't let the admin and the privileged accounts go off of the same device. Have a separate, like a, a separate access workstation, a privileged access workstation. I like the acronym because it's PAWS, um, and I like PUPS. Uh, but so you know, making sure that you separate that account and separate how people have access to them if you are doing your backups, and you're all doing backups, right, because we're going to defeat the ransomware folks. If you're doing a backup, don't forget to test your backup. If you do not test your backup, you're probably going to be in for a big surprise. I was a, a green admin years ago, and I had a whole month of backups, and I was so proud of myself. And then I said, well, you know, I better just, I'm going to check this one, day 29. Let me just make sure. Well, it turned out there had been a bug in the backup software, and the backups were not completing properly. For this whole, I managed a global network at the time. The, the critical servers were not getting backed up. So test your backups. It's really, really um, important to make sure that you do that. And then um, also stay current. And if you don't need something from a legacy, get it out. And keep that in mind in, in, your, you know, in your own personal hygiene life with your family. If there's some legacy apps, legacy operating systems that you don't need, consider getting rid of them. Because again, the attacker's not just going for the newest, coolest attack. They're going for the attack that works. So that's why with the legacy, you want to make sure that you, if you don't need it, um, or any service or, or uh, other uh, information that you don't need that can turn off, especially if it's an older app that has not been updated or it's an end of life operating system. These are uh, where you know, the attacker, again, doesn't care it's end of life. They just care if they can exploit it. So I hope that was that, do you, do you feel cyber smarter now? <laughs> yeah? You're all going to be in cybersecurity? Yeah? All right. Um, well, thank you very much. I don't know if we, I think that we're just about at time. I don't know if we have time for questions. That's so, yeah? Okay. Thank you.